Hello, and welcome to the Michigan Medicine Online Bariatric Support Group Meeting. This interactive online session will take about 25 to 30 minutes of your time and will guide you through important information about surgical procedures, the basics of nutrition and lifestyle changes, and emotional and mental aspects surrounding bariatric surgery. There will be a quiz at the end of this presentation to test your knowledge and prove completion of this online meeting. Here at the Michigan Medicine Bariatric Program, we want to set all patients up for success. We provide support group meetings in hopes to connect patients together and create a community where patients are comfortable asking questions, opening up, and discussing weight-related issues. Education is a huge component of support group meetings. One of the benefits of having these meetings is to provide patients with an opportunity to ask questions about surgery, nutrition, and tackle emotional or social support issues. Support groups also provide a way to connect people with the group of patients who have gone through or are going through the surgical process. This online forum will provide education. However, we still highly recommend in-person support group meetings. First, we will discuss surgery options. The bariatric surgeons at Michigan Medicine perform two different types of surgeries, the gastric bypass, which is also called the RUNY, and the sleeve gastrectomy. The gastric bypass, which is shown here on the left, involves surgical division of the stomach to create a gastric pouch. Then, the small intestine is surgically connected to the smaller gastric pouch. In doing this, food bypasses the stomach and the first portion of the small intestine. No parts of the stomach are removed from the body. On the right, we have the sleeve gastrectomy. The stomach is created into a small, narrow tube, and approximately 80% of the stomach is then removed from the body. The size of the stomach changes pretty drastically after surgery. For a gastric bypass, the stomach is reduced to the size of an egg. And for the sleeve, the stomach is reduced to the size of a very small banana. Next, we will discuss nutrition, food, and beverages. The actual surgery process might be considered the easy part for many people. Surgery is not the quick fix for weight loss. Weight loss does occur very fast in the first few months after surgery, but ultimately weight loss may slow down. This is when it's crucial to have learned healthy dietary habits so that you're able to make smart food decisions and continue on your weight loss journey. For those who think they'll be able to eat whatever they want after surgery and still maintain weight, this is often untrue. Weight loss and weight maintenance involve making changes to a healthy lifestyle, and bariatric surgery is just a tool to help you reach your goals. To put it simply, bariatric surgery plus a healthy diet leads to improved health. On the other hand, bariatric surgery plus poor nutrition leads to a potential for weight regain and worsened health. So what exactly makes a healthy diet? There are three food groups to consider. The first being protein, the second being fats, and the third being carbohydrates. These three together provide what we call a well-balanced diet. It's important to know that protein, carbs, and fats should all be eaten in different quantities in the diet. This image shows the ideal bariatric plate and how most meals should be set up. You can see the breakdown between protein, vegetables, starch, and then the fruit on the side. Protein will always take up half of the plate and make sure to always eat it first. Second is vegetables with a little less than half of the plate. And the third being starches like potatoes, white potatoes, corn, and peas, taking up a very small amount of the plate. Another way to think about the breakdown of food is using a food pyramid. This here shows a bariatric food pyramid. You can see at the bottom, hydration is very important. Getting in plenty of water or zero calorie beverages is crucial. Next importance would be lean protein from meat, low fat dairy, tofu, or beans. And of course, lots of fruit and vegetables. 
Finally, the small amount at the top is for healthy fats like peanut butter, nuts, avocado, or any oils. So you might be asking, wait, what's missing from the pyramid? Pasta, rice, bread, crackers, pretzels, juice, and soda are all missing from the food pyramid. These foods are high in carbohydrate and can sometimes slow down weight loss or even lead to weight gain. We recommend limiting or avoiding all of these for the lifetime. One of the most important food groups is protein, and it's important for many reasons. Protein preserves muscle mass, prevents hair thinning, it's needed for wound healing after surgery. It's also essential for a healthy immune system and helps to manage hunger and keeps you feeling full. Before surgery, it's important to start evaluating and learning about the foods you currently eat and the foods you should be trying. Starting to read nutrition facts labels is the first way to analyze what you're putting into your body. The Nutrition Facts label can be a bit daunting with all of the numbers, grams, percentages, and ingredients. So let's try to simplify it. We break it down to the five main categories of what to look for. Serving size, calories, fat, carbohydrate, and protein. Feel free to ignore all of the percentages on the right-hand side of the label. Starting from the top, serving size is the amount or volume in the container. Often, serving sizes are much smaller than you may typically eat. All values on the label are based on one serving size. If you have two servings, you would multiply all values by two. So for this example, there's eight servings in the container, and the serving size is two-thirds cup or 55 grams. Next are calories, which are the energy supplied in food. If calories are not burned up during the day, they will be stored as fat. So for this label, there are 230 calories in two-thirds cup. Next would be total fat. The lower the fat content, the better. Make sure to choose foods with zero grams of trans fat and also try to limit the saturated fats as much as possible. Keep in mind that there are certain foods that do have fat in them naturally, like peanut butter, avocado, or oils. These are considered healthy fats, but should always be eaten in small amounts. Carbohydrates are very important to look at. Always try to keep in mind and look for no added sugars or sugar-free products. You see that this label shows that there are 10 grams of added sugars in one serving. Lastly, and most importantly, is protein. The higher protein content, the better. Higher protein meals and snacks will keep you fuller longer. So on this label, this product only has three grams of protein in two thirds cup. So it's a pretty low protein option. So it has three grams of protein, 10 grams of added sugar, and eight grams of total fat. Maybe not the best option for such a small portion of food. Another thing to start reading and paying attention to would be the ingredients list. Don't be surprised if the names are hard to pronounce. On the ingredients list, ingredients are listed with the largest amount of product listed first and the least amount listed last. So on this label here, you can see granola is the first ingredient, which has brown sugar listed as the second most ingredient. Underlined in red are all of the different types of sugar hidden in this food item. That's why it's important to read through the ingredients list to see exactly what goes into the food you're eating. Food companies will often try to hide sugar anywhere they can using words that they know most people don't know what they are. We've discussed the nutrition facts label and the ingredients list. Next, let's discuss portion sizes. A really popular and common way to measure portion sizes is by using your own hands. So you can see here in these images, if you use your own hands, you can kind of eyeball how much a correct portion would be. So you can see a fist is one cup. The palm of your hand is three ounces of meat or also a deck of cards. Your thumb is about one ounce of cheese or also your thumb could be considered one tablespoon. So for instance, one tablespoon of peanut butter. The tip of your thumb or your nail is a teaspoon. A very small handful is one to two ounces of nuts or snack foods. And a tennis ball is a half of a cup. Now we can combine information from the nutrition facts label and portion sizes to start tracking food and beverage intake. 
Tracking what you eat can really help. Phone apps can be extremely convenient when tracking food, beverage, and condiment intake. Often, it can be very surprising how many calories are in certain foods or how small the actual portion size is. Tracking also helps to keep people accountable for what they're eating and when they're eating. Shown on this phone here are some common examples of apps we recommend to our patients, like MyFitnessPal, Lose It, MyNetDiary, and Berrytastic. Berrytastic is actually formulated specifically for bariatric patients. All of these apps have free versions on the iPhone and Android applications. Don't rule out pen and paper. Tracking on pen and paper is also a great way to be mindful of everything you're eating and drinking. Whether tracking on your phone or tracking on pen and paper, always record the amount, size, or quantity of food consumed. So you can see on this log, a half cup of dry oatmeal, one tablespoon of honey, and coffee with one tablespoon of sugar. Amounts play a huge role in calculating calories, fats, and proteins. Don't forget the beverages. Oftentimes, these go untracked. So this tablespoon of sugar is still providing calories and carbohydrates for the day and should always be added. One thing that most often goes untracked are condiments. Condiments are dressings, dips, sauces, sweeteners. All of these have calories and oftentimes they have a lot of calories for a very small amount. It's important to track these to get a very accurate reading of how much you're taking in every day. Most importantly are the calories and protein that are calculated from your daily food log. This way you can tell where you can make changes to either increase or decrease these numbers. Immediately after surgery, protein and fluid goals are very important and will be your main focus. The goal for protein every day is 70 grams and the goal of fluids every day is 64 ounces a day. These goals may be hard to reach right after surgery, However, it will become easier as you heal and can take in more volume. Something to discuss on the topic of nutrition and learning about food. You might recognize many of these labels that are often found on packaged foods. You might even choose foods that have these labels thinking they are healthier options than foods without these labels. Things like natural, healthy, gluten-free, non-GMO, vegan, or USDA organic. Don't let these labels fool you. Food companies are in the business of making money, so you always have to keep that in mind when you're browsing the grocery store. Food companies latch on to the latest diet trends and will label their foods a certain way to seem healthy or healthier. Just because something is vegan doesn't make it healthy. Just because something is gluten-free doesn't make it healthy. An organic brownie is still a brownie. While these foods are sometimes better options, they're not always the healthiest in the long run. The second part of nutrition are the vitamins and minerals. Not only is a well-balanced diet important, but vitamins and minerals are too. Regardless of surgery type, whether you're having the sleeve or gastric bypass, vitamins and minerals are required for life. They are not a temporary habit after surgery. Vitamins and minerals are important after surgery because you will be eating less food and they are needed to prevent vitamin mineral deficiencies. Work with the dietitians to find a schedule that works for you, since some of the vitamins and minerals cannot be taken together. Always ask if you're unsure. Vitamins and minerals are absorbed all throughout the stomach and small intestines. After both surgeries, vitamins and minerals in food are not well absorbed. Therefore, you will be required to supplement with vitamins and minerals. Not only will you be able to eat less food, which affects vitamins and minerals, but with both surgery, absorption of vitamins and minerals is impacted because of the change in anatomy of the stomach. As you can see, with gastric bypass, vitamins and minerals no longer go through most of the small intestine or the stomach. And with sleeve, since most of the stomach is removed, you have less surface area to absorb some of these vitamins and minerals. It's important to get into the regimen of taking vitamins and minerals before surgery, so it's an easier transition afterwards. The first one to start is a multivitamin with iron. 
You can see common examples listed here, like Flintstones Complete, believe it or not, have everything an adult would need in a chewable form. There are also swallow tablets. Just make sure that your multivitamin has at least 18 milligrams of iron. The second vitamin to start is calcium citrate. There are different forms of calcium available over the counter. You will definitely want to look for the calcium citrate form. You have to take this separate from the multivitamin, and again, here are common examples you can find. You'll see that the word citrate is shown very obviously on the label. A multivitamin and calcium are the only two that we recommend starting before surgery. Vitamins after surgery are vitamin D and a sublingual B12. Sublingual means it goes underneath your tongue. This chart here goes over the lifelong schedule for vitamins and minerals after both surgeries. You can see with gastric bypass there are five time points in the day where you'll have to take a vitamin or mineral. Or for the sleeve, there are three time points in the day. All of the vitamins and minerals cannot be taken together. Unfortunately, your body can only absorb so much at one time. You can see that the calcium citrates are always separate from the multivitamin, and sometimes vitamin D is best absorbed with the calcium. Please ask any of the dietitians if you have any questions about when you should be taking your supplements or if you've purchased the right kinds. A common question for bariatric patients is, what if I gain weight after surgery? Weight regain after surgery is common, but with proper diet and exercise can be improved or possibly reversed. Weight regain can happen in a few different ways, but with the most common being incorporating foods back into the diet that are high calorie and do not keep you full. For example, snacking on pretzels, crackers, chips, even in small amounts can tack on a large number of calories and often leave people hungry for more. Another concept is what we call grazing, or also called eating around the surgery. Grazing, or sometimes called eating around the surgery, happens when people are eating too frequently throughout the day. So you can see on this clock example here, there are small snacks that are being eaten about every hour. And even these small amounts of food can lead to overconsumption of calories. If you add up all of these numbers, it averages about a thousand calories, and it's not even including the lunch meal. You have to remember too, even healthy foods can cause weight gain. Avocados, nuts, seeds, olive oil, peanut butter, they're all very healthy, but the portion size is very small and they have quite a high calorie count. So even these foods can potentially lead to weight gain. Emotional eating is another thing to consider with weight gain. Emotional eating is the practice of consuming food, usually comfort foods or junk foods, in response to feelings instead of physical hunger. Emotions like sadness, anger, anxiety, stress, or even boredom can lead people to reach for food. Emotional eating can have many different root causes. Work, family, finances, health, relationships, traumas, all of these can bring up different emotions in people. So why food? Negative emotions may lead to a feeling of emptiness or an emotional void. Food can fill that void and create a false feeling of fullness or temporary wholeness. Here on the right is the emotional eating cycle. At the top, we have stress or any other emotion that leads us to want comfort through food. So food or eating provides temporary relief but those positive feelings fade, and many people then feel guilt or shame, which then restarts the cycle of emotional eating. You can see how this plays a role in weight gain or even weight loss. Ways to cope with emotional eating will be discussed in the last section. The final topic are life changes before and after surgery. Earlier in the presentation, we discussed what you're eating, but before surgery, it's important to figure out why you're eating. It's also important to discover your own personal reasons for seeking bariatric surgery. Is it a lower number on the scale? A smaller pant size? Is it to reverse chronic disease, stop taking medications? Is it to be more active with family or sleep better? There are many reasons to seek weight loss surgery and not one reason is better than the next it is important to figure out why you're eating. 
The topic of emotional eating comes up again, and as a refresher, emotional eating can be defined as eating when you're not physically hungry, like boredom, anxiety, stress, or even happiness or celebration. Emotional eating triggers can be very subtle or also can come on strong. It is crucial to hone in on what your specific emotional eating triggers may be. Here are some questions to ask yourself. Have you ever eaten a big meal and still felt an urge for more food? Have you ever kept eating when you know you're not hungry? Do you reach for food if you have nothing else to do? For example, when you watch TV, do you have to have a snack? Do you eat when you feel sad, annoyed, angry, disappointed, lonely, bored? These are all very important questions to see if you do have emotional eating and then how to move forward. In regards to emotional eating and bariatric surgery, Emotional eating is part of almost everyone's lives, with some people being more affected than others. Unfortunately, surgery cannot change or fix these emotional eating triggers. Surgery is on your stomach and not on your brain. Learning to find new coping skills that don't involve food can sometimes be more challenging than surgery itself. The Hunger Within Workshop is one way to help work through the cycle of emotional eating. This workshop through the University of Michigan is a 12-week in-person group therapy session that explores the core reasons for overeating, identifies the triggers that cause a binge, and helps break the vicious cycle of emotional eating. Be sure to contact the program if interested in attending. This information is also available on the Michigan Medicine Bariatric website. Another way to work through eating triggers is one-on-one -on -one therapy with an eating disorder specialist. Contact our program for a list of therapists we recommend. Support groups, whether online or in person, can connect you with people who have gone through surgery and have likely dealt with emotional eating or any challenges before or after surgery. These people may be able to provide helpful advice as you move through this process. Leaning on your social network is important. Finding family, friends, or coworkers to lean on is helpful during the bariatric process and all the emotional changes afterwards. You're welcome to bring your support person with you to all appointments, support group meetings, or the nutrition education class just before surgery. Many things will change after surgery, not just the scale. You'll find that your surroundings will change and will notice that social outings, relationships with loved ones, your relationship with food, these all may change after surgery. This is where a supportive and nurturing support group of family, friends, colleagues, or online community can help you navigate these times. As always, contact our team if you're struggling with any of these life changes. Success is very hard to measure, but those who do well after weight loss surgery do a few things. They change their mindset, they change their lifestyle, they're physically active, they follow a well-balanced diet full of lean proteins, vegetables, and fruit, and they also follow up with their healthcare team even when they're struggling.